Uh, welcome to the post MPC press conference. We welcome the governor, the deputy governor, members of the monetary policy committee, members of staff of the CBK, and uh, yourselves, members of the media. I notice a lot of new faces today, so I might have to go through the usual rules that we have here, where you can turn to the person next to you and they can explain to you. But what we do is uh, the governor will go through his statement uninterrupted. Once he's done making his statement, we'll then come back and do question and answer. And in that Q&A, uh, we will do it in order, uh, but I'll explain once we get to that stage. So for now, the governor will speak uninterrupted, uh, and when he finishes, we'll come now to you for all your questions. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, colleagues. Good morning, uh, members of the media. Um, this is a standard post MPC meeting press briefing, and we'll cover the usual ground, and then obviously at the end uh, add a few other questions that you may have. So the, the first thing in terms of uh, how we're going to do this is go through the sectors or go through the issues that came up um, in the discussion and how MPC members in the end came up with the decision that they made which you've already seen, it's uh, been circulated widely, um, which is um, keeping on hold the, um, the stance, the, the stance on monetary policy. So maintaining that stance on policy and therefore maintaining the interest rate, um, the CBR rate uh, where it was. But first, in terms of the economic issues, Inflation, we always start with that, has fallen to 5.7% in June, and we expect it to remain stable, meaning around that area. You already know that uh, our target for this fiscal year will be the same as it has been for several years now, which is 5% give or take, plus or minus 2.5%. But the reason for stability um, is that uh, in terms of food inflation, that doesn't seem to be a significant concern, uh, meaning we now know that there, there, looks like, there, looks, there is a pipeline of food, meaning in terms of the quick growing vegetables that were problematic, that were problematic some time ago are now obviously in the market and uh, that, expect, that is expected to continue. So food is not such a concern. It is true that uh, we always have that, uh, let's say, um, monkey wrench that always gets thrown into, into the mix, and this is the price of maize, in particular the supply of maize. But this is anybody's guess in terms of uh, do we have enough, do we have we, because the reports we are getting obviously are thoroughly conflicting, but I think the point here is that uh, um, so far that seems to be, that doesn't seem to be a concern. Importantly, uh, looking forward, there will be mechanisms or there can be mechanisms uh, to deal with it if indeed it becomes a problem. But at this point, um, there's no source for concern. That is food, energy prices, uh, we know that uh, this is also another one that uh, we get a lot of volatility. And now you know there are all these international tensions. Now we are talking about the Persian Gulf area, Iran, um, and uh, those, other, I mean, those other countries around that, uh, Saudi and so forth. But I think the point here is that uh, the prices don't seem, at this moment, looking ahead, um, they don't seem to be uh, let's say, on an upward trend. Then, of course, one, one would talk about electricity prices and things like that. And uh, here we are comforted uh, by the fact that there is now an increase in the proportion of uh, um, energy that is being generated from, let's say, more sustainable sources, and in particular wind, geothermal, and so forth. So I think the point here is in terms of fuel and energy, the, there, doesn't, there is obviously some concern, but that those concerns don't uh, 
I mean, don't seem to be, we don't, MPC did not see these concerns as significant, um, but rather something to keep in mind and to monitor going forward. Then, as you all know, there was the excise tax that, uh, an adjustment on the excise taxes, um, which is to keep it in line with inflation, that is, uh, and the adjustment was done on various products on July 1st, from July 1. And this was also factored into the, into the numbers, projections, and so we expect that uh, for the first time that impact will be on uh, the July numbers that will be coming out next week. But still, this didn't seem to be a significant, um, let's say, source of concern. Uh, we, by the way, have had similar adjustments in the past. Uh, since the first time we had this adjustment was in 2015, actually November of 2015. But I think the point here is that we factored all those things into the um, assessment that we expect the inflation to remain stable around where it is now. Now, there's a, th there's a final factor which may be in some people's minds, which is the impact of the demonetization. Governor, will this have a negative effect of, on inflation? I'll deal with it later in detail, but I think the answer that uh, the MPC had is no. This is not something that uh, we should be concerned about. So, all things considered, inflation is expected to remain stable um, and well within the band. Overall GDP growth, there was a, um, this is the first time that we have met uh, with having or having the Q1 data, Q1 uh, of this year, 2019 data available to us. And I think uh, we, you probably have already analyzed this yourselves and noted that actually uh, Q1 data, um, agriculture was much stronger than we were expecting. Um, and uh, on the basis of this, um, and we did go through all the, all the um, let's say the, uh, well, what it meant, what the, the areas of difference were the sectors that were weaker and the ones that were stronger. I think agriculture is the one I would want to flag now. The others we could discuss, but I think that's one I want to discuss. Um, we've also looked at the indicators since um, uh, May, May, actually April um, to date, since April, that is Q2, beginning of Q2 to date. And, uh, and basically we've noted some interesting factors, for instance, um, some interesting uh, sort of indicators or indications or uh, directions that the economy is moving towards. And uh, the first of this is huge growth in some of the intermediate goods, um, and uh, it, which shows that there is um, the final goods, there would be sort of significant, um, let's say, production or output um, of the final goods. But again, these are indicators, and uh, for every, uh, I mean, for every one of them, uh, one needs to understand uh, why it is actually a positive indicator as opposed to maybe indicating a shift in composition or other, other elements that may be taking place in the economy, other changes. Bottom line is 2019, we expect growth to remain strong. I think last time, two months ago when we chatted, when we met here, we did talk about uh, waiting to um, to do a better assessment of uh, our projection. And the better assessment now is that we actually believe that uh, growth in 2019 will be stronger. We are projecting 6% as a, as a sort of, a, a, let's say, baseline, um, but with significant upside potential or upside risk. So it can be stronger than 6%, uh, but I think at this moment we are okay with uh, with a 6%, which may very well end up becoming more conservative than uh, maybe other indicators would, uh, or the outcome would be. But again, this is something we'll continue revising um, as we get more data. One of the interesting things, and now, yeah, one of the interesting things that we could talk about is, uh, and this is one of the let's say the upside to the GDP growth that we just now mentioned, is the SMEs. 
We've talked about SMEs before um, and told you how this, the implication, the impact of the SME sector in terms of uh, GDP, in, uh, in terms of employment, in terms of incomes, in terms of livelihood, and we've made the point that this is significant, we need to focus on it. It may be a not so tidy sector, but in terms of uh, economic dynamism, you know, this definitely is uh, a significant sector uh, that needs to be strengthened. Well, as you know, recently, to, as we came to the end of February of uh, financial year, the financial year that ended uh, uh, at the end of June, there are two things that uh, were significant and actually had, a strong, impli had strong imp implications on the SMEs. The first is the payment of pending bills by the central government, i.e. the national government, and also the counties, the county governments. There are also other private sector entities that also ended up paying uh, pending bills in this area. But I think the focus then was the pending bills that uh, the government, national and uh, and counties had, and I think we all remember there was all this pressure, and really beginning with the smallest, SM, uh, the smallest uh, pending bills, meaning there was a sense that instead of you know you could think of a large entity contractor that has a huge pending bill, and then you sort of say okay this is what needs to be paid. The idea was to begin at the bottom of the pyramid, and then uh, meaning those small pay those small. SMEs, those small suppliers, you know, cover all those. And frankly, between this and the second element, which is the release of consolidated cargo in the, uh, um, at the ports, um, there was effort to do that. We actually noted as, uh, as the MPC first that the noise level from SMEs had come down. This is interesting. Just in one month. And uh, also there was a sense that, uh, yes, the SMEs um, had, uh, were getting some life support in that sense, right? Because they are getting their, their pending bills. So in that sense, uh, they, they can then begin to deal with their issues, repay uh, whatever they needed to repay, and so forth. I hasten to add that this is not mission accomplished on the SMEs. We are just saying this is a start. And that start, whatever it is, uh, it shows that actually the SME sector can actually turn on a dime, can actually uh, recover quite quickly. And I think these are things that we may want to investigate and dig deeper. I mean, you're journalists after all. And we also as economists need to investigate and see how to strengthen, how to continue to strengthen on a, in a sustainable way the uh, the SME sector. Of course, there are the other the other tools, other instruments that are coming or that have been put there. For instance, we've talked about lending, but it isn't just lending; it's lending plus. Um, but I think uh, I I will stop there in terms of the SME sector. I need to quickly say a couple of things on the external sector. External sector. Um, if you actually look at all the, my comments in the last say even six months. Uh, the external sector has continued to strengthen. So you think about it in the context of the uh, current account deficit. And this actually, we've always been projecting a narrowing of the current account. And, uh, and this is no different. We now are projecting, I mean, the current account of 2019, we still expect it to be at 4.5% uh, of GDP. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the details because uh, they are really this, they are very much, uh, let's say, uh, variations of a theme. So the theme is resilient agriculture, and you know what products those are, um, horticulture, flowers, things like that. Uh, also services, we do, we do export a lot of services, you know, particularly to the neighboring countries. Um, remittances also are very strong. Uh, we now have hit an all-time record, and we continue to go record to record. Um, the, the last uh, uh, 
had the number here somewhere. Anyway, yes, diaspora remittances, um, uh, the last number was for June, I believe, uh, June, and it was 295.2 million US dollars. That's a record. That's just in one month. Um, again, the diaspora is, is, it's interesting to have the diaspora sending this much remittances because it is in a sense they are voting with their feet or with their wallet. So this is a vote for the um, sort of, in, 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 they are voting that they have, uh, they are optimistic about the Kenyan economy. So voting with their wallet in terms of uh, optimism um, for the, in the Kenyan economy, the prospects of the Kenyan economy. And uh, of course there are other things, it isn't just money that is being sent to support the family. This obviously has a lot to do with investments as well, not just in T-bills but also actual investments in terms of, uh, let's say, even building stuff, you know, whatever it is. So I think this is one to watch. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say in terms of the of external sector, I mean, the current account and, and so forth. But I think it's worth also noting, um, sort of looking a little further. So we are here and yes, we expect that over the next few months, the current account will remain uh, where it is, meaning we expect it to be around 4.5% of GDP. I think I've, I have mentioned the point before that uh, running our models, we expect it to stabilize around 5% in the medium term, 5% of GDP in the medium term. But that's okay. I mean, being off by 0.5% isn't a problem. I hope you understand that. In, but I think in a, in a long term sense, medium term sense, there are positive indicators that support, uh, let's say, further strengthening in the medium term of the current account. And these are, uh, there are two I would want to mention. First, of course, is the, um, let's say, the, 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 the agreement on the African uh, continent of free trade area, which obviously will lead to significant an enhancement or improvement in expansion of uh, trade with our neighbors and the rest of Africa. We will generally be net exporters. That's how we are. Um, because we are exporting manufactured goods and other, other even services to the neighboring countries and uh, so forth. As we have said before, 40% 40 40 of our exports go to the, um, the, uh, the, the sub-Saharan Africa, the rest of Africa. And so we could expect a continuation and a strengthening of this in, a, uh, in the medium term based on the African free trade area. Um, that continental free trade area that has been agreed and has become effective. The other things, there are concerns one could ask about Brexit, but uh, we've made this point uh, that uh, we have been assured that it will be neutral whichever way it, it goes for us, at least in the near term, uh, near to medium term. So our trade regime will not change, will be unaltered regardless of the Brexit outcome. whether um, So in that sense, we are comfortable um, and we will have to deal with the longer term issues, but I think in the short term, we, uh, we, are, we are covered as it were. Um, then I wanted to say a few things about the banking sector. And I think here, very briefly again, we, we keep talking about it, so. <coughs> The point, of course, is the liquidity risks. Um, the liquidity risks uh, have obviously been uh, well, minimized in, as a sector as a whole because the sector is quite liquid. Um, the issue war has always been the pockets of, uh, let's say, apparent shortages of liquidity, meaning some banks um, that may be less liquid than others. So distribution, and this I think we continue to um, on the stance that we had talked about, we had mentioned before, which is making sure that there is better distribution of liquidity. Um, and uh, this, as we have said before, has become less and less uh, of a problem, meaning less and less significant. So it's becoming smaller and smaller. 
in terms of the distribution or redistribution of liquidity in this system. Credit risk, um, and this had been, has increased in terms of, had increased in the past. Uh, if you think, for instance, in terms of NPLs, you know, those had increased. But this time around, we saw uh, they are beginning to ease, right? And uh, so there is a, they, we, are, we are seeing this easing, you know, of uh, credit risk. And uh, in part, it's true the NPL ratio to total loans has come down marginally by something like 0.2% between say uh, June and the month, two months before that. But I think the point here is not to, I mean, it's true that is a, a turning point. We've reached a turning point. But I think the point here is to continue to encourage the banks to do what they need to do, to deal with the NPLs, um, to deal with them in terms of uh, working, having workout arrangements with the uh, with the uh, those the creditors that obviously have uh, uh, that may be stressed in terms of paying um, their loans and things like that, um, and also of course going beyond that, it isn't it isn't something that is just to be done once. It's something working with the with the customer, and uh, this is important, particularly when we think about banks being more and more customer centric. Other risks include operational risk. This has this have always been there, but I think we are we've been pushing banks to minima, to take actions that will minimize their operational risks. Um, and the I mean, you can imagine some of the things that uh, they need to deal with, for instance, on uh, on their cyber security area uh, to make sure that they are better protected and they deal. I mean, they and they they actually are. Uh, have an active, or should we say, uh, proactive posture uh, in dealing with those risks that may be um, uh, may may face them. I don't want to talk too much about reputation risk because that's always there. Um, it means things related to, for instance, uh, yeah, AML, CFT issues uh, that a bank may be involved in, and so forth. So, but this this is. At least just in terms of uh, uh, definition or labeling, yes, that is there. But any bank uh, needs to deal with all of them. I mean, you cannot say it is AML, CFT, therefore let's leave it aside. No, it is part of the operation, including when you deal with customers and so forth. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I think uh, we could talk some more about other things, but um, the banking sector also is consolidating. We talked about this last time. No need to wax poetic about it. But these things take time. So I don't think we should be frightened that uh, there's a lot of noise about some of these things. Um, but I think the point here is the progress is clear, the direction of travel is clear, and we continue to watch uh, that space. Um, then I'll talk about other things very briefly. Um, financial markets, maybe first to begin on the T-bill side, on the domestic uh, debt side. Uh, suffice, well, maybe we should first say that we had a domestic borrowing target uh, for, the, for the national government. Uh, that was uh, for the previous year, 2018-2019. And this was 310.2 billion. 310.2 billion, I think that's the precise number. And uh, suffices to say that we actually hit that target. Um, despite all the noises, despite all the uh, seeming uh, kind of, let's say, people questioning whether we'll actually hit uh, the um, this target, uh, I think it is good to say that uh, our, we are proud that our staff, even when things were appeared impossible from the perspective of let's say the uh, those that have uh, or take on themselves the business of uh, assessing how things are going, you know, how are you 
Um, so it's good to say that uh, our, our team, obviously working with the National um, Treasury, um, were able to hit this. I think I would say comfortably that if we wanted it to be hit to the second decimal point, they can do it. I'm that proud of them. They can deliver. So it's good to be clear about that. They have the tools, they have the ability, and uh, maybe a fourth decimal point may be difficult. <laughs> uh, but I think I, I'm serious about that, that they, they, they actually can hit a target if you wanted it, right? So that is good. Of course, we've been given a new target for this fiscal year, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to execute on it. The point on the Treasury bill market, or like, rather the government securities market, there has been significant oversubscription in, uh, in, the late, in the recent months. April was oversubscribed by, it was what, 171%. March, sorry, May, 141%. June, 214%. So this speaks to a lot of interest, and you could also say it speaks to some sort of excess liquidity in the system. And it is true, we did have excess liquidity in the system. Uh, part of that was because of the injection by government of the pending bills. So when government pays uh, into the system, into, let's say, your pockets as uh, citizens, well, that is money that was actually locked, in, locked, locked up, that is now being released, and, uh, and private sector can then use it to do all sorts of things, including purchasing T-bills. So that was one of the elements. So if you were to talk about how things were towards the end of the fiscal year and the beginning, meaning June and uh, earlier this month, we, it was characterized by excess, uh, let's say, heavy liquidity, excess liquidity. And I also talked about the, the liquidity that banks had. But I think the point here is that uh, our people are able to manage this liquidity um, in particular ways, and we are comfortable in terms of where they ended up. I wanted to say a few things about the, oh, before going to that, I needed to say that uh, in terms of uh, our, uh, let's say, going back to the external sector, the external sector, as we said, uh, is strong, meaning the, current, the, the balance of payments. But the point also is to remind ourselves that uh, how much we have in terms of reser reserves and all that. And I'm reading the the press release um, that actually we have a 9.6 billion US dollars in reserves and uh, that is six months, uh, more than six months of imports really, more than six months of import cover. So we believe that this provides adequate cover uh, and uh, buffer against the shocks that may come in the future. Um, now it's true there has been some questions by some of you, I would call it misinterpretation of things as to what is driving what. And, uh, and I can only say that uh, the, we, it goes back again to understanding what our exchange rate policy is. And I will not tire in repeating what our exchange rate policy is. We have a flexible exchange rate regime, meaning we allow the exchange rate to move wherever it wants based on the, uh, based on the factors, supply demand factors in the market. So we don't target a rate neither today nor for December or any of these things. The only thing we do is to minimize the volatility. So we will, in effect, lean against the wind, which is when, the, when there is a very strong appreciation, we will lean against the wind to slow the pace of appreciation. When there is a very strong pressure to depreciate, we will lean against the wind and intervene to minimize the pace, to reduce the pace of, uh, of that uh, depreciation, if that's what the market, what is coming out of the market. So I think the point here is uh, um, wherever we should not panic when uh, there is a movement, 
Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at the changes that have taken place in the recent past, you are talking what? Zero, less than 0.5% per day, uh, if it is that. I mean, both ways. So these are not significant. If you go to other countries, look around. So it would actually be good to have, uh, when you write your articles, to compare it with other countries. But anyway, maybe, maybe that I leave it to you. It's not me to say how you should write your articles. You know? But I think the point I'm making here is uh, uh, the, the market has not changed. And I'll talk about that in, a, uh, in, in the near few, in, in a few moments. Okay. I talked about pending bills, but I think before moving to other things, it is good to say that uh, uh, the MPC survey, uh, as always, it showed that the inflation expectations are well anchored. So those concerns uh, don't seem to be bothering a lot of the people. They expect the, uh, the inflation rate to remain largely where it is. Um, and, uh, and they noted, this is interesting, they noted the positive effects on sentiments from the payment of arrears. That's interesting. So the payment of arrears, we talked about it, but actually you can see the source of that is not ourselves. It's actually people who've been paid or people who know people who've been paid, um, whatever it is. So it, it is actually interesting to see that it, it filtered down to um, to the lowest, uh, let's say, level in the economy, and this is the sentiment, uh, this is what we are getting from the MPC survey. Um, also, the survey showed very strong optimism in the Kenyan economy in terms of economic growth prospects, uh, and all of them were around 90%. Banks, actually, their sense of optimism was at 87.5%, meaning they are very optimistic or optimistic on the economy, the prospects of the economy. And uh, non-banks were at 90.6%. Optimistic or very optimistic? Actually, if you are w w watching this, this is the first time that non-banks are much more optimistic than banks. But uh, as my professor will tell me, well, what is the significance level for this? Um, it could very well be the difference is uh, irrelevant, but uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor. So then I need to move to other things, which I think now we'll, we'll kind of mention and then, uh, uh, well, and then, and then open the meeting to Q&A. But before doing that, we should say that the private sector credit growth has risen a little to 5.2%. And uh, this is the highest level. It keeps moving up, a bit like a snail. Um, so we wanted to, to excite it a little so that it can move a little further, a little faster. But at least the direction is up. And as we have said before, um, we will continue to encourage banks to use available means come up, be innovative, come up with other measures that will provide credit, uh, particularly to the SME sector. And I think in uh, recently there has been, of course, you've heard about Stawi, and we intend to go into the full launch um, shortly. Uh, but I think the, there has been other products that commercial banks on their own have actually, um, let's say, begun or initiated and uh, uh, began to use. Um, there's one that I think it's kind of interesting, which is by, I think it's Tanbik, and this is the... Um, dare to achieve, and dare to do what? So it is dare to achieve, and anyway, whatever it is, it's DADA. That is the acronym. And it is a play on words also, because DADA, you know, we all know what that means. And it is aimed at women, um, and it is sort of finance plus, so, but anyway, I'm just, this is just one of several examples. We talked about equity last time, that also has, so everybody uh, in effect is, is getting seized by this um, objective of uh, having an instrument that really works with SMEs. That's where the action is, and that's where the action will be going forward. Okay. 
Um, one of the things we need to remind you is that things are not looking good in the global economy. Uh, the global economy, the IMF released its, uh, let's say, update, WIO update, and they, re they released this two days ago. And actually, they've, they've shaved down by 0.1% uh, the global um, economic um, well, the, the global growth. I'm sorry, it's stuck, but that's okay. I think I do remember what is in there. Um, so global growth has been brought down uh, by 0.1%. And we have, we have talked to you before that uh, when it gets to 3%, that is the stalling speed of global growth. Now, things may have changed, but I think uh, that's the rule of thumb. Around there, uh, you begin to stall. So we are, we are, we are cutting it close. So the, the, the risk of uh, significant turmoil in the economy is in, in the sorry, in the global economy is increasing. Now, the, the countries that actually um, seem to be where the problem areas are, first in the, in the emerging markets, so EMDAs, which is emerging market and developing economies. Um, because, first and foremost, because of the, let's say, spillovers from the trade wars and also from the what, trade and technology wars, uh, which are now already, um, well, maybe they've abated a little, but they're still there. There are other things to be of concern. Europe also seems to be anemic. And uh, what was interesting there was a scaling down of growth of one of the large economies, one of the drivers of economic growth in, uh, in Europe. And then, of course, you have other, other problem areas, areas. But I think the point is... Uh, this, is, this uh, update is quite sobering um, in terms of the prospects of the, of the economy, global economy, and we are stuck with them. I mean, we cannot, we are connected. We are, no one is an island. We are all part of the main. Um, and I think the point is, this is why we look at that area and uh, I'll look at the global growth and realize that we do need to be well, uh, let's say, well, forewarned, as it were. Okay. Then I go to other things. Um, maybe on the fintech things. Um, I'm a bit disappointed I didn't see all of you at the fintech conference, but maybe we should talk to your, to your, um, let's say your editors and so forth. But in any event, it was a very successful pro uh, conference. Actually, it was a festival, not a conference. We had do, uh, some 2,000 participants uh, from 43 countries, and eight countries had more than 20 participants, 55 exhibitors, students 110. That is those people that came in claiming to be students. Um, and uh, we know of, well, and the, there were students who are from 16 different universities around Africa. I think I gave you some of these numbers before. But the other things that obviously uh, are part of this, the global hackathon, so you'll hear more and more about that going forward. And the idea here is whoever wins this hackathon, two of them will get a prize to go and uh, participate in uh, a hackathon in, uh, in Singapore. You know, so. So it's really been, uh, let's say, showcased, as it were. But in terms of the content of the, con of the festival, I think that was very, very successful. Uh, we had more than 100, more like 140 uh, wild leaders or wild, wild leaders in this area, um, in, in the area of fintech. And uh, a lot of people went home with new ideas, particularly the idea of collaborating. So collaborating with others in this space. Um, then finally, finally, the issue of demonetization. I need to say a few words about that. I think the first thing is to say it's working well. It's working well. And I'll explain why I think it is working well. Um, there are obviously some questions that have come up. 
I mean, I have been listening and talking to a lot of the people um, in the country and wherever. And one and some, one of the questions that comes up is, um, Governor, what is the impact on inflation? And everybody seems to be, or some people seem to be uh, worried about that. And their question isn't actually on the demonetization as such. It is, what's the impact of the new notes on inflation? Now, this, in my mind, belies a deeper fear, which is what happened in 1993, well, around then, when we introduced the 500, and uh, we introduced the new 500, and then there was a surge in inflation. Inflation has never been higher than those years. Exchange rate didn't, has never dropped faster than in those years. Fiscal uh, performance has never been worse than it was in those years. If you are talking of a sort of a disaster zone, uh, Kenya was a disaster zone in terms of fiscal, in terms of macroeconomic management. And I think that is where that question is coming from. And so my answer to that question is, first and foremost, uh, the introduction of the new notes as such uh, has nothing to do with what happened in uh, in, the, in that experience. That experience was because of the, let's say, the what was being financed. So in a sense, it was being printed. So this was financing using the print press. Remember, you know, all I can tell you is that button, the print button on my desk has been disabled. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. So we are not funding government. We are not funding uh, financing that is the all the other uh, let's say projects which are very good in themselves even uh, elections which is what happened then so print to finance something uh, the answer is absolutely not as a matter of fact we are prescribed from doing that in our art so I want to be absolutely clear that that is not a <coughs> That is not a risk that uh, you need to worry about. Secondly, even as we introduce the, uh, the new notes, um, we are, in a sense, withdrawing the old notes, and in particular the 1,000, right? So in a sense, it is a simple operation of changing uh, things, including even the other ones, meaning when they, get, they run out of life, when they become completely Think, for instance, the 50, uh, which seem to be the dirtiest. Of course, we are going to withdraw the, the, those 50s, right? Some of you have been putting them on, on Twitter. Uh, you know, a 50 that has sellotape all over it. Um, and you wonder, is it a 50 or is it sellotape? Uh, maybe it has more sellotape than 50 shillings worth of sellotape. But anyway, it's still 50 shillings, and it is your money. Um, so in that sense, the implication on inflation is zero. As a matter of fact, the point, if you want to be technical, the point of uh, money chasing or more money chasing few goods, um, the point is that we, do, we will not increase our monetary base. If anything, with demonetization, we will reduce our monetary base to the extent that there are all these currency outside banks that will become worthless, will become paper on October 1. So I think we need to be, uh, to be well comforted that uh, that is not a concern that, uh, that you, should be con you should be worried about. Another question that has come up is with regard to the availability of new notes. Yes, Governor, thank you very much for the new notes. But my ATM is spewing old notes, the old 1,000. Now, the answer to that is, actually, when we launched the notes, we didn't go full blast. What we did is to put out some so that people can actually begin to get accustomed to them. Kionjo, right? So to get a taste of the new notes and how they look, how they feel, uh, Wallace tells me that we also like smelling the notes. 
uh, that's fine. Um, so that was the thing. But however, from last week, and really into this week, and going forward, we have been putting out only new 1000s, the new generation 1000s. That's what we've been putting out to the banks. And they, in turn, have been feeding the ATMs with the new, new generation currency 1000s. So maybe today, the ex and the expectation is by the end of this week, virtually, I should say, most of the ATMs around the country, mark you, around the country, will be dispensing new 1000 shilling notes. Now, this is important to, uh, to explain that uh, in the first instance, we want to begin from, you know, out there, you know, machinani, you know, away from the, uh, from the center, um, let's say the main cities and things like that, and continue um, also, you know, right through to end of October and in, into the future, I mean, end of September and also into the future. But I think the point I'm making here is that um, now those notes have been available and our expectation is your salary when you go, whoever will be paid this uh, at the end of this month, you know, we expect that most of you will be paid in the new currency. Um, actually, we would probably say that we expect other things. We expect that it won't be currency as such. We expect that you'll get it in your bank account and all that and uh, yes. And, but uh, the point is just for those of you that for instance have workers, and uh, we'll pay them cash and pay them at the end of the month or whatever else it is. When you go to get your cash, it will be new generation currency if you're getting 1,000. Now, for the other denominations, it doesn't matter. For the other denominations, you'll get both the new and the old, and it's all mixed up and so forth. That's one point. Um, the other question is about the deadline. And I, I would want to be completely unambiguous in terms of what I'll say, which is the deadline is and will be September 30th. The deadline for conversion of the old 1,000 banknotes, which are still legal tender, the deadline is September 30th. So if on October 1, you are holding 1,000 of the old 1,000, then that is worth just paper. It's just paper, no matter how much it is. So let, is, let this be absolutely clear. Now, it's true some of us, you know, they say that the last minute, if it were not for the last minute, many things would never have been done. Now, this is a point we need to encourage our people that there wouldn't be any last minute. So it's now. It is now. You have two months. Obviously, we need to ensure that uh, this message is getting to everybody, not just you and me. I mean, I or you could, uh, at lunchtime, let's say, go over, you, let's say, have uh, some 10,000 uh, worth of the old 1000s, you have 10 of them. At lunchtime, you can probably go to the bank and have them exchanged. But think of all those people who are in the um, very far away in the rural areas. They don't generally go to banks. Um, they're just transacting. Maybe they're just um, people who are uh, small um, farmers, you know, and they really don't go that often even to the local duka. There's a little kiosk, maybe a kilometer from where they live, and uh, beyond that, nothing. Meaning they don't go to the big duka or you know the uh, the metropolis, the larger metropolis. So this is why we need to encourage them that they need to go and get the old 1000 where they have kept it, whatever it is. You can imagine your show show and uh, where she keeps all those uh, money that maybe you gave them, uh, you gave her last time you traveled and all those other things. Yeah, and then have that converted. And then we have explained how the conversion process works. 
meaning if you have less than one million, you can go to any bank, any bank, uh, whether you have an account there or not. And most of us obviously have access to them, we in the urban areas, but uh, I think it is harder when you're in the rural areas, and this is why we need to continue reminding them. Now, that said, we have we have really been going full throttle on the public awareness campaign. And uh, a lot of you know we've been doing TV, uh, sort of uh, on TV, let's say, ads even, print, print ads, uh, online, social media, the posters every single place. I am willing to, uh, anyway, I think virtually every little place that, ha that sells, um, let's say, most commodities, consumer commodities, you'll see that they have a poster. And we are, we are not talking the main uh, towns and the main, uh, let's say, supermarkets. We are talking of going all the way to, you know, as far as possible, you know, Ukomashinani, you know, in there. So that is happening. Also, we are, and we will be in 70 plus vernacular radio stations. That is not a surprise, I hope to you. I mean, most of you are probably in a different area in terms of media, but we are already there. And I have already appeared, by the way, in uh, uh, five stations, five radio stations. It was a very interesting experience. And I will continue to appear in others. I appeared on, on uh, Ramogi FM with, uh, I got to know somebody known as Vincent Juma there. Um, Moussier FM, which apparently is the Camber, uh, is in the Camber, well, language, right? Uh, this morning I also appeared um, on Radio Citizen, hosted by Vincent Tatea and others. I appeared on Muga FM. I've also appeared on Endesa, en Engesa. No, Endesa FM. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I was doing very well in Kisi this morning, you know, very well. Now I have uh, fallen <laughs> on my face. Now, of course, this, uh, it's easy to do. Well, it's not easy, but I think the point is, it's, it's easy, these are generally under the one umbrella, right? We all know that radio, radio media, royal media, sorry. So it was easy to go, well, you go to the same building uh, and that helps. But that, does, that, that is just an issue of convenience. Obviously, we are, the, sto the radio stations I talked about, um, they are all the other radio stations. Um, so, I mean, we'll appear on what, Radio Africa, appear on Star FM, which is what, Somali language, uh, Midimo, and others. We have actually already seen and had reports from as far as Somaliland, actually, inside, that they, they had our, um, let's say, our, our message um, in the radio that, uh, in the radios that we have, uh, that, that they are listening to, and so forth. But I'm just making the point that uh, we need to continue with this public awareness campaign. If there are any concerns, um, any concerns whatsoever in this thing, I think uh, the answer is simple, which is um, you can call the number that was included in the poster that we circulated and in the press release that we circulated some time ago. And uh, so you can contact any member of the public, uh, can contact the CBK by telephone at 202861032 or 202863132. So those numbers um, can be useful if you have any questions whatsoever. So I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Uh, as usual, what we will do is <coughs> put your hands up. We'll
trying to go around the room, maybe take four or so at a time. Once uh, you have the microphone, please stand up, say your name and your media house, and then ask your questions. Uh, one at a time, please, in terms of the questions. We'll come back, we'll try and exhaust what you need to exhaust. But uh, just for the sake of fairness, you do one question per person at a time in this first round. My name is Kimani, uh, and I work with the National Broadcast. I have two questions. Um, you have been retaining the rate, you know, at the current uh, nine, is it 9.5% in the last uh, six, pa six months or so. If you do a situational analysis of the rate for the last uh, couple of months, what has it tell you? What has been the impact, you know, in the local lending market? Bearing in mind that we have seen a very small growth when it comes to the private sector uh, a credit advancement from five from 4.4 percent to 5.2 uh, percent. I would really want to find out uh, what um, a statistics telling you and why. Uh, banks are not willing to lend to the private sector at the pace that is desired. And then, um, if you can give me an update of how much of the new currency has been released into the market, that would be great justice on my end. Thank you. Any other questions? So let me just see the hands. So I can see Brian, who else? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, my name is Brian Gugi from the Business Daily. Uh, I know you have said that the CBK is not concerned uh, with the actual level of the shilling in the forex market, uh, but we have seen the exchange rate move from 101 to 104 in the space of a month. Uh, what factors uh, have driv driven the depreci depreciation, and uh, should we now start to worry about uh, the volatility? Can I press move down? Huh? Same question. Uh, David Abling from Bloomberg. Um, Parliament has begun uh, debating an amendment to the Banking Act that will effectively um, restore um, uh, the red caps um, as they are. Uh, what's the uh, central bank's uh, take on this uh, fresh attempt to to keep the, the, the red caps. And then on the, um, uh, could you give us the fiscal deficit um, as at the end of June uh, 2019? Uh, thanks. Good morning, Governor. My name is Kefa Moirore from Radio Citizen and also affiliated to EGESA, as you put it. <coughs> I hope I look good this morning. <laughs> So this would be my question in particular to demonetization. And you know, you mentioned the worry is not about you know money going into government payments and so on. Uh, but the concerns, having myself listened to the devil's advocate, as you put it, Wajiwaji, is that without data to support uh, how much money is going uh, is coming in and going out, that's that's where the speculation has stemmed from. So. Even in relation to what Mr. Kimani had asked here, if you'd clear up the numbers for each of the currency printed. Secondly, I would like to uh, to know the impact of uh, you know broad money in supply within inflation. I mean, uh, M3, as as you call it, has been on the growth, but uh, we never really see its impact on inflation, and uh, we are just curious, even as we query uh, the impact of demonetization, uh, what how has uh, money in supply been an effect? effect into the economy. Thank you. Uh, this is the first time I'm getting technical questions. It's amazing. So thank you very much. Congratulations. This is a space I like. Uh, but you know, you've caught me off guard, right? Because I had never expected these questions about M3. Uh, but, uh, but suffice it to say, this is my daily week or my cup of tea. Um, the only trouble is you only have a few minutes. But anyway, so let's deal with these issues. Let's begin at the top. Uh, Kimani was asking about situational analysis about the impact of uh, this 9%, uh, um, maybe CBR. I think the point is as follows. Um, remember what the MPC is doing, right? So maybe to put it differently, as by way of example, it's in the driver's seat. And it is 
turn in the steering wheel based on what is coming or what is happening down the road. So if there's a bend, it needs to begin turning uh, the, uh, the steering wheel appropriately. So the data that it uses is precisely the data that I tried to explain, um, that I explained to you. So the point there is, yes, um, the, 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 uh, the, the data, as I explained, and the risks. It's a balance of risks as well. Now, you are talking about impact on local lending, and I explained uh, what the private sector credit growth is, which remains anemic. 5.2% um, again is, say, uh, GDP, uh, nominal GDP growth of what? 13% say around that. So you can see even as a share of uh, um, uh, credit of uh, GDP is actually falling. So the point is, and we have been talking about this, there are other reasons for this and we are hoping that it will eventually continue to push uh, private sector credit growth upwards. Even as there is a, a, a sort of an innovation and therefore there is less and less let's say the ratios are changing. So to go into technical things, we expect that the velocity will be changing, that the velocity will be increasing partly because of the innovations that are taking place, um, and also the multiplier. The multiplier will be rising appropriately. So I think the point here is the MPC has indeed looked at those factors, and, uh, and that's why um, they, have they have also balanced it against the risks. Um, and then um, also being careful about the other point which I didn't mention, which is while we are still in this interest rate caps environment, uh, there's still a serious danger for perverse reaction. So it is a bit like you do not want perverse outcomes. So going back to the image of the driver, um, you do not want to floor the, the, the accelerator going around the bend, even though you think that you are a good driver because you may end up crashing on the side. So the risks are huge. And that's why I think the MPC has been much more prudent and uh, made those decisions. Um, there was a question, well, maybe to deal with the M3, how has it moved? Well, we could discuss that later. I, I have the numbers, but <coughs> let's uh, let's punt it to later. Um, the point is that uh, the, the ratio versus, uh, let's say, GDP has been falling. And that is sort of a significant element. What we have spent a lot of time doing is discussing the sources of growth of reserve money and indeed uh, broad money understood. And I think that is where most of our conversation as part of the MPC and indeed as economists uh, generally has, has been. But at this point, there wasn't anything of note, of significant note or out of the ordinary. Um, and that's why I never flagged it uh, to you at that time. Now, both Kimani and uh, I forget your name. Yeah, Abdi or whatever, yeah. Um, I remember you, but I, it's just the name I, that's escaped me at this moment. You asked for data on the new currency and all that. And I think I would, only, I would only say that at this moment, it's really at the beginning. Remember what I said, that we only released a bit. And now we are beginning the big release kind of thing. So whatever data I give you today is actually completely pointless. Um, you, you understand? It's not something that is, uh, I think, would be informative. Um, it's good to ha give data when it is informative, but when it is not informative, it's, it's, uh, it will end up, in my view, confusing the, uh, yourselves, the listeners, and indeed ourselves, because then we'll chase that line. Um, next month, you'll ask me exactly the same question, and it is not the data I would want to release. Um, remember, the only thing I said last time is we have 217 million pieces of 1,000. I think that's the number I gave you. That is a number that you need to remember. And uh, so if I told you that I have X number of pieces, um, it doesn't mean anything in my view. Uh, so I don't want to confuse that and I uh, hope we understand each other. 
clarification. I think you should wait. I, I think you should wait. So I wanted to address Brian's question. And uh, the question is, your question about the exchange rate movement. First, I, I, I do, you said 101 to 104. 101 to 104. Those numbers I don't know. Let's begin there. There's a lot of hysteria out there among the Wajuaji. And I watch the same, I am on Twitter, I'm on Twitter. I'm not a Twitterati, but I, I see some of the conversations that are taking place there. And you really wonder what is going on, you understand? The facts are the facts. And yeah, there, you know, you can say 104, but what is 104? Or what is 101? When? You know, you understand what I'm saying? We can, we publish, as you know, every morning we publish the rates of the, right, of the night before. And you have those rates. You just go in there and see where it was, right? And see where the closing rates are. And try and locate the 104 for me. So how these things are put together, I don't know. And I cannot query that, you understand? Those are, it, that doesn't help you, doesn't help me, doesn't help your listeners, doesn't help your writers and so forth. All I can say is the following. Over the last, uh, first we have had uh, excess liquidity. I mentioned that before. So that obviously, all things equal, that's an economist again. I hope uh, mm -hmm. my friend at the back there is learning some economic terms. <laughs> um, so all things equal, increase in liquidity would lead to some sort of imbalance, which will, would need to, um, which, which, which would need, which would require, or let's say, would lead actors um, to, uh, let's say, move into the exchange rate market. I think that makes sense. I mean, this is straightforward. So that is one element that was there. I talked about excess liquidity, um, huge amounts. And I think we know how the liquidity came, so we understand that. And we saw it happening. Secondly, you also had some, let's say, payments that were coming through. And these are private sector payments. And in the past, some of the actors, meaning uh, private sector operators, um, I don't want to name the names, but I can assure you that I know the names. So let's just accept that I have the names. Yeah? Not in my little book, but I do have the names. Um, so those actors, those, let's say, companies, um, needed to make payments, external payments. And uh, this was something that was, in a sense, uh, not one of the normal sort of payments. Meaning you could think, for instance, a loan uh, has ex exhausted its grace period and now it's beginning to be repaid. You understand? We are not talking government, by the way. We are just talking private sector, right? Um, so that then would lead to new demand in uh, foreign currency. So in effect, what happened over this period is in addition to the higher liquidity, there was more demand on, uh, an, um, or, uh, of uh, foreign currency relative to the inflows that were coming in. And that's what led to sort of a, sort of a pressure uh, on uh, depreciation pressure on this. Now that said, we are not a very big market. So as you know, we at times have huge swings, huge swings. And that's why it's important for us to be, to understand where the sources, what are the sources of this pressure. And when it is genuine, obviously we don't want to, 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 to hold back, you understand? Of course we have the firepower, we've already talked about that, you know, almost 10 billion of, uh, of US dollars. So it's not uh, an issue that we don't have the firepower, it's an issue of understanding where that is coming from. So I hope I've explained to you uh, the elements of what happened in the market, say, the most recently. What we expected to, we expect some of those imbalances will sort themselves out. 
we expect that there will be an increase in uh, uh, additional inflows. Um, we expect that the usual payments will continue to be made, you know, usual demand. I mean, think about uh, we, we import every week. We, we, we buy petroleum oil, right? So those are usual things that need to come through. We expect, for instance, there will be uh, outflows due to, let's say, dividends that have to be paid. Those are all things that, uh, that uh, we expect, and therefore um, that should not, be any, should not lead to any source of concern, whatever happens in the, in the exchange rate market. But I think in that sense, I would uh, encourage you to be, um, let's say, less fixated on slight movement, small movements. You are talking about the business daily, and you had an interesting headline a few days ago. Shilling, euro bond, fall because of vacuum in uh, national treasury. I think the facts are different. It's true on that the day before there was uh, the, a movement in the exchange rate, as I have explained for that very reason. But it had nothing to do with the whatever vacuum or whatever else it was, the activities of that day. Um, if you have talked to anybody who says that, then I would have I would want to understand what really drove that, because that wasn't the case. If you are, however, if you are talking about the euro bond, I'm talking of uh, the yields on euro bond. That's the standard thing that uh, everybody looks at, the yields. Um, and I have a table here that has the yields from this week, um, starting from the 22nd which I believe was Monday, and, uh, and there are one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five specific bonds, these euro bonds that we are talking about. You know, the new ones that were <coughs> issued recently and also the ones that uh, from yesteryear or some time ago. And all of them, all of them, the yields have been falling. If anybody wants to audit me, they can always audit me. It's here. Um, then let's move to David was asking about Parliament debating bills on rate caps and all that. You know, I, Parliament has its own mandate. We have our own mandate. So at the right time, if, I, if they want to ask my views, I'll present my views. So at this point, I think uh, you know our views about rate caps. That's all I would want to say. What else is happening around the world and around the country? I would rather wait um, to be, uh, I mean, to put our views known exactly once we understand what exactly this is. Uh, it is important not to shoot from the hip. It's important to respond when you have clarity of what the question is. I think we understand each other, David. Uh, then there was the issue about fiscal deficit. Well, I think the point I would make, I would only make one point here, which is uh, uh, the overall deficit, everything combined. The numbers we saw, obviously we, did, we do look at the fiscal side for obvious reasons, um, but I think the point is the overall deficit was something like 700 billion. Can you, and now we are talking of uh, the last fiscal year that closed, which is something like 7.4% of GDP. Um, and uh, in there, the details, I'm sure, will be presented to you at the right time through the usual sources. Uh, the issues there, as always, are revenues, and uh, which continue to, um, I mean, as we know, through the year, they have been lagging. Uh, I mean, they have not been according to the target. And, uh, and then, of course, on the expenditure side, they've had to be, expenditure had, has had to be pulled back. Um, and uh, consequently, anyway, so partly because of the short of the shortfalls in revenues, um, but I think the point you are asking is about the overall deficit, and have quoted it for you. Other questions, please.
What's your last name, George? Who? Okay, George. Good afternoon, Governor. Good Jimmy Bogo from K24. And I have two questions, actually. The first one is in terms of the old 1,000 notes, uh, how, how much has been returned so far? And uh, the, uh, the other question is uh, in terms of uh, flag transactions, uh, what is happening there? And uh, what is happening in terms of trying to seal off the number of people that have been operating in illicit uh, ca cash transactions? Um, Dominic Omondi uh, from The Standard. I have two questions. Uh, my first one was, is uh, on the current account deficit. And obviously we know that uh, diaspora remittances have played a key role in um, on, uh, narrowing the current account deficit. Uh, we've, uh, in June, we've, seen, uh, we've come to the end of the amnesty. Uh, are we still going to have uh, the kind of uh, inflows uh, from... Uh, from abroad that we've been enjoying. My second question is on uh, treasury bond and treasury bills. Ob obvious, uh, there's the subs oversubscription on uh, treasury bills, but then treasury is trying to uh, reorganize its debt, uh, push it, push, push it uh, ahead with the, the, the long term. What are you doing about that? So that uh, we don't, even, even though we have the oversubscription on treasury bills, uh, we also have uh, an idea where we, we will have more of the long term and less of the, of the short term. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Winter from uh, this Chinese paper. Uh, I just uh, want to find out uh, with reserves of uh, above 6.2, 6.5. Do we still need the IMF facility? Thank you. Okay. Give me a second. Let me look at my notes here. Uh, okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so first on uh, the question by George, I think the point we'd make is the following, or several points. First, uh, the issue of corruption is a significant drain on our economy. It's a significant drain on our economy, significant drain also on society. If we end up becoming a, a sort of a, an economy that depends on uh, ill-gotten gains, I mean, the, the economy is gone. But worse than that, the society is gone. So I think we need to start there. And this is why it is so important to use all available means to deal with that scourge, to get rid of it. That's one general point. The second one is, of course, the issue of those of us that are given certain responsibilities. Right? There's that, that saying that uh, for those of us that have uh, been given a lot, a lot will be demanded of us. And we have to take that seriously. It's not just an adage that we are happy with. Um, we are responsible, we are given a lot of responsibility. If you, are, uh, if you have a particular public office, but it's not just public office, you could think of a CEO of a private company or a head teacher 
or a teacher or a nurse. Unfortunately, at times we hold the, um, the, the bar high for, say, a nurse and sort of say, oh, your vocation, your vocation. I think we all have seen pictures of, and I have them, if you want to see some of them on my phone, pictures of some people who are amazing, amazing. I recently talked about those two workers, central bank police officers, that were their job, their station, and went out of their way to rescue a child in particular ways. And when you talk to them, you said, yeah, we did it, but uh, this was, this is what we are called to. Now, maybe we feel strongly about the police officers, the nurse, the teacher, but then we don't feel the same sort of, uh, view, we don't hold the same view to other people that are in high offices. And that, I think, is a concern that we obviously have to deal, deal with as, as a society um, and, and more than that. There is the issue of the institution. If indeed we as leaders of institution end up doing things that actually um, maybe uh, are not, or show that we are not responsible, then of course uh, the institution gets undermined. And it is important that we remember that it is the institution, it's not the people in the end, it's the institution. There has to be a certain culture in that institution that supports the objectives that we just talked about, including having, uh, making sure that the corruption isn't there. But corruption isn't the only evil. Um, there are other evils that also have to be dealt with. So that is the general uh, sort of uh, background to what I, uh, to the answer that I'm, the concrete answer that I'm going to give you. So in terms of uh, what has happened there, I think the point is obviously um, the charges have been put out. You, as you saw them the same way, maybe you saw them before us. But I think the point here is obviously they will be given a chance to, um, uh, not to defend themselves, but to actually explain what happened. And uh, yeah, I mean, the point here is you are not, you are not, um, you are charged, but that doesn't mean that you have been declared that you're guilty. That is important. The due process is extremely important. Due process, data, um, information, clear charges, due process is essential. And I think that is also something we've talked about uh, as Kenyans in the context of, say, due process in the courts and due process in every other uh, area. So that is important. So you're asking our views. The first one is that, yes, that the due process will prevail in terms of these things and so that they can actually explain and, uh, and so forth. Uh, in sec or thirdly now, maybe, um, the point is that it's an institution. And uh, some of us are talking about vacuum. I don't know what a vacuum is in an institution like that. You cannot have a vacuum. There are processes. Remember, somebody can die in office, right? So what does that mean? That we are going to go through, a, the country will be held hostage just because this has happened. There are mechanisms in place. And those mechanisms are executed. I mean, frankly, if we needed to make a payment, you know, two minutes later, who would have been able to make that payment? Now, maybe your lawyers and yourselves don't know those mechanisms, but well, that's another issue. The point is the country cannot be held hostage just because somebody hasn't shown up because he's, uh, he's passed on or whatever else it is. And it has to be done legally. There goes the issue of institution. It's the institution, not the personalities. And I think this is what maybe we need to cross that bridge and realize that actually strengthening institutions is fundamental. It is the institutions. It is the institutions. And making sure that the institutions have all the uh, let's say, the, the resources that they need to execute on their mandate. So I hope I've explained myself in this and uh, made it very clear that uh, we hope that uh, this is a significant step or one of the steps towards further strengthening of all institutions, Treasury um, and others, um, but in, uh, consistent with the law 
but uh, I think the hype of uh, vacuum and things like that, I don't know. Those I'm not going to talk beyond what I've just said. Jim was asking about the 1,000s, uh, how many have come so far, and also the flood transactions. Well, Jim, as I explained a uh, short while ago, maybe this is not the time to have uh, this conversation on the numbers because I, I think it would lead us the wrong way. The only thing I can say is that a lot of the exchanges are below 500, 500K, you understand? Which I think is completely consistent with what you and I uh, would feel, right? I mean, most of us don't have millions. I mean, if I were honestly, if we all wrote on a piece of paper, honestly, how much cash we have, you know, in all the places, I don't think, I'll be very surprised if any one of us had one million. I'll be very surprised. It, it, so the point I'm making here is that uh, there is, uh, the, the, the numbers at this moment are a bit raw, meaning we need, we, we, they will probably lead us the wrong way. Um, because we are really very much at the beginning. The most important thing is to remind people that they need to convert their 1,000 old series uh, notes. That is the most important thing. And in particular, you know, the farthest reaches of our country, um, meaning people, now I don't mean just physically in terms of, you know, farthest from Nairobi in terms of kilometers. I mean, frankly, even people within uh, 10 kilometers of Nairobi could very well be very far away because of the way they live. Um, think, for instance, of you know, the uh, maids that uh, work in Nairobi and all that, and maybe they are paid this money and they are saving it somewhere. Um, the point is, that is the main message that I would want to convey. But we'll give you the, um, the numbers at one point. What I would uh, recommend, Jim, um, is uh, in the near future, not in the next two months, in let's say, definitely let's say sometime next month, let's have a, another press briefing. Um, it, maybe that will satisfy you at that time. Then we have a question by Dominic. Amnesty, amnesty. You know, I have made this point on several occasions. I don't know where those numbers come from when that suggest that you publish or you write in your newspapers and elsewhere that uh, the amnesty has led to, I don't know, significant inflows, whatever. From where we sit, we don't see that. But we are willing to be convinced. Bring the numbers. Let's look at them. Don't point at the... Uh, at the uh, diaspora and say, ah, all this is amnesty. That doesn't make sense. Uh, so look at it and uh, tell us why you think it is amnesty. I think there are people who are hyping that amnesty. You talk to KRA, talk to whoever else needs to, who has this uh, thing, I mean, who has the, the responsibility for this, and uh, show us the numbers. I would actually tell you that uh, we do look at all, the, I mean, it didn't, it didn't start with the, with the withdrawal of currency. I mean, over the years, we have sight of anything above one million Kenya shillings. We look at it, and uh, we can go as deep as we want. And uh, banks also have, uh, have that responsibility also for reporting, not only monitoring, but reporting. And everything we know. We haven't seen anything that would uh, suggest that there has been significant inflows due to the, uh, to the amnesty. As a matter of fact, my question would be, okay, if there's amnesty, where are they going? Where's the money going? You know, so tell me where it's coming from and also tell me where it's going. T-bills? I can tell you to the last name who bought what. You understand? And it's that level of detail. It's not just hypothesis. So I, I'll leave that for now. Um, I think I've explained the ATM issue and so, oh no, no, the T-bond that you are talking about was uh, what have I, what can I say in terms of uh, 
the the move let's say the changes that have been there uh, ha have uh, taken place in the government security markets in terms of maturity profile that's what you're asking and uh, here we can say that uh, the on the t bonds on the bonds <coughs> let's say treasury bonds the average time to maturity you know has increased from 7.3 years in uh, um, no, has increased from 6.3 years, 6.3 years in July 2018. And it is in July 2019, it was 7.3. So you can see it has increased by one full year. This is the average time to maturity. Actually, if you go farther back, it, the increase is much more dramatic in terms of if you go back like two years. So we've been supporting this sort of increase or lengthening of... Uh, maturity of uh, T bonds. Now this obviously has happened or has been supported by the issuance of uh, medium and long term bonds in 2018 and 2019. Um, it's interesting that there's a lot of excitement about even uh, uh, we put out uh, what, what 15 years. No, no, the one that's 15 years. 15 years. 15 year bond. And it was supposed to be 50 million, and it, the subscription, sorry, absolutely, 50 billion. You see, I forget. Is it millions? Is it billions? Is it thousands? You know? Uh, anyway, so it's 50 billion, and we got 86, 86 billion. That was the, um, the offer, the bids that came in. So you can see there's a lot of uh, excitement, right? Now, obviously, we are not going to go with 86. You know, we, we will be prudent and uh, stick within our limits. Um, but I think the point here is we are managing it. This was your question, Dominic. We are managing that with the, with the National Treasury uh, because we have that responsibility as the fiscal agent to make sure that, uh, they, that uh, their finances are being brought in in order. So that is the point I would want to make. Now, there are other things that have also changed. Um, uh, the, the, uh, anyway, uh, let me not uh, get into all the interesting things about bonds and, or rather the, the market, but uh, the point, the only point I would also make in this is that the yield curve has been stable. Uh, that has been quite stable in the sense that it has been uh, moving gently uh, or, yeah, it has been moving gently at various points, um, but most of the action actually has been on the short end of the yield curve. But uh, the, one of the successes over the recent years was creation of a yield curve. And this was a major success of our staff, um, obviously working closely with the National Treasury employees. Uh, finally, the reserves. Martin was asking, uh, if we have all these reserves, do we need the IMF? Uh, do we need the IMF program? I don't know. I think I, I have made my point before, which is, in a sense, you don't know. The reason we, we get an IMF program, uh, part of it, a strong reason for it, is having insurance against an extreme event. Extreme event. When we get, if we were to get a shock, uh, what you do is actually go through the various buffers, right? First is policy, in terms of uh, you need to, say, strengthen policy to address that risk, I mean, to address that shock, um, and, uh, you know, whatever it could be in terms of tightening monetary policy or loosening monetary policy, whatever it is. Um, but I think the point is, first, you have the policy buffer. Secondly, you have the immediate... Uh, other buffers that you have um, and thirdly you begin to dip into your reserves or to deal with that and then eventually you begin to deal with other sources of uh, other buffers including uh, the in an extreme case the uh, the IMF sort of arrangement our view of an IMF arrangement is it would generally be it would be a precautionary arrangement so I hope uh, these words of, uh, you know, bailouts and, 
whatever the words that you want to uh, to label this are not labels are not labels or words that uh, I would we, that uh, you know would be uh, I mean would apply in our case they wouldn't no, they are not so it's really an extreme case and as we have said before you buy insurance before the house burns so the right time to uh, to buy insurance is when the house is okay if, uh, if you are trying to buy insurance when the house is burning or is about to burn, uh, you know, A, it will either be very expensive or you won't get it. You know, the place will be closed and nobody will be interested in talking to you. So that's all I would say in terms of uh, our, let's say, direction that we are heading in terms of uh, relationship with the IMF. Any last thoughts? I know the Please make sure it's something that has not been asked before. It's already one o'clock. My name is Miriam from Kenyan Wall Street. My question is on dom domestic borrowing. So, there's, okay, there's been a report last week. There was one by Moody's that government's reliance on, on local banks' funding exposes the government to, okay, maybe in case something happened in the banking sector, it leaves the government vulnerable. So my question is your view on that. Uh, thanks, David from Bloomberg. Uh, you mentioned the excess adjustment will have an impact on inflation. Could you give the exact, uh, do you see it? What did you say? Uh, the excess um, ad adjustment, what exact impact um, in terms of points, uh, percentage points you see it having on, on, on inflation? And then um, I have asked you a, a couple of times about the NYS2. Uh, you said you're still um, finalizing that. Um, do you have a word on when you'll take action on the next batch of banks? Um, and then lastly, could you give an update on the um, KCB uh, IBL uh, takeover? Uh, depositors have been waiting um, for that deal to be concluded. Thanks. <laughs> Afternoon once more, I'll be quick uh, with my two questions. One is on external lending, a uh, very good picture of uh, healthy domestic lending in line with the targets. Uh, but even as you, s you spoke of uh, last time of a ceiling, uh, us approaching the ceiling, uh, the scope for external lending seems to be actually very attractive now. We, we are expecting cuts in the ECB and, and, and the Fed. And uh, the fear is that uh, Treasury or the government may feel uh, that as a better option. I mean, looking at the average uh, T bill uh, for 365 days against what's a let's say Europe. Yes, and then my last one was on uh, digital lenders. It's something you've spoken of before, and now my question is just to nail the coffin: Is uh, are you seek, would you seek to have uh, the digital lenders brought under the Banking Act? Thank you. Brief uh, clarification. You, you have said uh, that uh, you expect the monetary base to, to reduce on the completion of the, the monetization exercise. Is it uh, an anticipation that some people holding the 1,000 notes may not come on board? Uh, ju just, just an explanation on that. Okay. All right, thank you. I think that is it, okay. Governor. Maybe we begin with Brian's. Uh, the point is we already said that there are people who are holding cash. Uh, that they uh, got illegally or ill-gotten. Obviously, we don't want that to come into the banking system, do we? That otherwise, the whole point of uh, this whole exercise is futile. So, by definition, we are doing it so that we can keep those guys out. Simple as that. So, in effect, we, the idea here is come October 1, they will be holding paper that they stole from somewhere, and it will be paper. So they can actually go ahead and burn it for all we care. <coughs> so their value, their net wealth will be diminished by the full amount, you understand? So I hope you are not having any second thoughts and mercy and those are the <laughs> my feelings. I hope you are not throwing feelings. Okay. Fine. 
So then let's deal with Miriam's question. Uh, Miriam, there are some things I don't understand that are stated. Uh, my point is, yes, uh, Moody's, according to your reports, um, and there is this sense that government reliance on banking, financing. I don't know if that is the case. I really don't know. Uh, you can look at the stock, but we are talking financing. I mean, if you look at, for instance, where the financing is coming from, uh, we just talked about the time when we, we were talking a moment ago about a lot of excess liquidity. I mean, some of these people that are bringing back their money, I mean, going back to somebody who was asking about the, the, maybe it was Jim, asking about the, the uh, amnesty, no, it was Dominic talking about amnesty and talking about the, the, uh, the diaspora flows. Maybe it's coming from the diaspora, diaspora flows. But in order to get there, maybe it's coming through the banks. So at the end of the day, who is holding the, the piece of paper? Who is actually making the, who's financing? Well, it may be, it's not the bank directly, but rather other institutions or people um, through what you may call custodial accounts. So I think that uh, analysis, with all due respect to those that were pushing that argument, is a bit too simplistic. And I would encourage them to look at the details and uh, to explain how this is. And we are willing to explain to you what is it that, you know, what are the numbers? They are public. We can show you where the numbers are and so forth. But I think the point here is um, there is no, there's no way we would want to have this sort of reliance on bank financing. Why? Because banks really are supposed to be lending. Lending. They are supposed to be dealing with the private sector. That's why it should be. And the government cannot be in any way crowding out or appearing to crowd out private sector that is um, out there, in a sense, uh, doing real business and so forth. So I hope I've answered your question in that sense. Um, but I, I think uh, the government has more options than, say, that article reveals uh, Moody gave them credit for. Um, and, uh, and frankly, uh, we are talking about this uh, high, should we say, oversubscription um, of those instruments. And it's not just the banks that are involved in directly with their own funds. Okay, that's it. Now, David is very precise. He wants me to tell him exactly what the impact is of the excise tax. You know, it's just an estimate. It's just an estimate. So it'll be somewhere, let's say, like less than a quarter of a percent. Less than a quarter of a percent. I hope that's sufficient. Um, but it is something that we've calculated. And this is why we were confident saying that. But now, if you begin to ask me what is a confidence interval and things like that, like the professor here would ask me, I'll tell you, OK, that exam, Sitafanya, you know, I'll fail that one, right? Um, now, you're asking about KCB and NYS and uh, all this. In terms of the NYS, we are still marking our time, OK? I NYS 2, as you call it. NYS 2 of 2, which is what you keep asking. But remember, we are not stationary, even as we mark our time. We are not stationary, even, even as we mark our time. There are other ways of dealing with this, and I would rather, when all this comes to the, comes to the, uh, in the fullness of time, I will reveal to you what the other options are. But don't be so fixated on, you know, bringing people to court. Uh, you understand what I'm getting at? Because that's what you're asking. When are you going to charge the next batch? And you want to see the next batch in what? In handcuffs? You know, sort of doing that. But my point is that may not be, uh, that may lead to a certain objective. You may get to that objective using other uh, techniques or other things. So in the fullness of time, we'll, we'll review this to you. KCBIBL, well, I know a lot of you heard me say last time, weeks, barely. And you've quoted me quite a bit. And today I just said the same. Uh, again, there are things that have happened that are way outside my, uh, what is it, my, yeah, preference, but more than preference, uh, 
Oh, terms of reference. Okay. Um, I guess uh, all I can say it's not easy. Uh, and I ask you to give me some slack on this one. It's not easy. I told you that there were huge interests. Huge interests. I don't know who, what's the biggest fight, David, you've ever fought. Or the biggest fight that your newspaper ever fought. Maybe it was a tax claim. Right? Maybe it was uh, an employee, a disgruntled employee. Just bear in mind, if 40 billion are at stake, they'll come after you with everything they've got. And they'll try and stop every step. And they have bought insurance. And you know what I mean by buying insurance. They, they know how to deal with these things. This is not an area that we are, let's say, experts in. Now, it doesn't mean that we are giving up. Oh, no, 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 don't. That's not the thing. We, we will continue. We made that promise before. But I think, David, what I, what I think you probably need to feel a little more is this is not, it's not happening in vacuum. And there are all those forces that are pushing you back and forth. And uh, the outcome, uh, unfortunately, has ended up delaying beyond what I had said last time. But I think I still say the same. I still say the same. Weeks, barely. I think that's what I said last time. I hope we understand each other. Then we have a final question, I guess, by Brian on external borrowing. Um, I've forgotten the question, but I think the point here is uh, the government does have options in terms of external borrowing, but remember that is limited by, by law, meaning they have already sent to parliament. You can actually look at the drop, you know, the budget paper. Also, you can look at the budget speech, and uh, it indicates their, plan, their borrowing plans going forward. They cannot wake up in the morning and just go out there and borrow. It actually has to be first sanctioned by parliament. So even as we say that there may be options for external borrowing, they are not without limits. So it has to be done in that context. Um, but I think the point here is that uh, I don't think the concern should be today and now should be concerns on borrowing. No, that is not the concern. Um, I think going forward, it's clear that they can finance or rather they can borrow what they intend to, uh, to borrow. So there's no sort of uh, shortage of funds, uh, having explained, for instance, the oversubscription and things like that. Digital lenders, our point still remains. This is a critical area that needs to be dealt with. It's critical not because of the size of borrowing. Now, we are talking of the, of the digital lenders. Now, I have to be, let me backtrack. There are two types of digital lenders, right? There are those that are relate to products that are, uh, let's say, of commercial banks. And there are many of those. You know, you could think of, uh, yeah, you have the Mshuaris, the KCB, Impesa, you have all those. And uh, we are requesting them, we've asked all the commercial banks that have those products to actually have a phrase in there, to actually have a, to actually put it in the, I guess, the product, that this is approved by the central bank. And that will distinguish it from all the other digital lenders that are there, online lenders, as you call them. The branch, Yala, Tala, um, Okash, all those. I mean, there's a whole litany of uh, all those. And, I, and the point we've made is that uh, this is very dangerous, that they're out there, they're not being regulated by anybody. So there are many problems that can come up. First and foremost, you know, the relationship with the customer. I mean, the idea of uh, the customer uh, being treated correctly, right? That uh, the customer is really, I mean, in terms of, let's say, even the, um, well, the, the, the terms that are given to the customer or when they don't repay or whatever happens, you know, that whole relationship, that is important. That is extremely important. And the customers have to expect 
the same sort of uh, customer relations as any other product, regardless of uh, whether it is uh, um, regulated by the central bank or it's not regulated by the central bank. The customer is the same. So that's one. The other one which is also problematic is where are they getting this money from? I mean, you can see that this could be your typical money laundering scheme. So it is important to understand why it is why this these institutions need to be uh, to be regulated. Um, otherwise, they are really uh, freelance institutions, and uh, and then you know one fine day they wake up, walk away from this place with all the money that they collected. I think you've heard about all these pyramid schemes, which are more in the investment side. I don't know. At times we appear to be gullible. I don't know why that is the case. But then, you know, you have this scheme and they are telling you, you know, you'll get 300% guaranteed, 300%. That is a good deal, right? But I think uh, we should all go back to the thing. If the thing sounds to be too good to be true, it is too good to be true. It's as simple as that. And so these get-rich-quick schemes um, often hide their poison you know, at the end. And I think that's why we are, we've been so firm about this and uh, we insist that we need to move forward in terms of regulating them. You did mention, you asked the question at the end whether they should be regulated as banks. And my answer is no. They, will not, they should not be regulated in the same way because they are not banks. For instance, they are not uh, taking deposits. Okay? If uh, it is a deposit taking institution, in any way, you, maybe you don't want to call it deposit, then you're a bank. That you have to be regulated correctly. But the point is that they, they, ha they, they do not need to be, and, they, and we do not propose that they be regulated in the same prudential way as commercial bank. That I think would not be proper. Um, but rather a regime that, is, uh, that, that fits um, their current operations and things like that. That we need to do quickly. So, All right. uh, thank you very much. I'll ask that we remain seated until the governor, the members of the MPC, and uh, members of staff of the CBK leave first, and then uh, I'll speak to you briefly, and then we can take off. Thank off. you very much.